So the last thing that I want to do is combine this with Bifrost. So let's say I've got this looking about how I want it to look. So I'm going to go to Bifrost, and we'll just bring up a simpler version of the scene. And what I want to do here is actually go in and solve based on the original position of this rigid domino. But I don't necessarily want to use the, the original domino itself. So this is actually the double blank domino that I have kind of positioned in the right place. But I don't necessarily want to use that for the Bifrost liquid. So I'm going to hide that. And I, instead, I created a kind of a simpler, lower resolution version of this. So typically, kind of the lower resolution shape is going to work better uh, than bringing in the full high resolution shape. But it's still the same general volume. And what I want to do now is actually create a liquid from that. And what that will do is it will just fill that volume with particles. Problem now is I can't really see them. So the first thing I want to do is just go in and find the point size and increase that. That doesn't change anything except for the visual representation. I might even want to make that a little thicker. So that gives me the kind of a visual representation, but it doesn't change the behavior of the density. So when I push play, what's going to happen is, much like the cloth did earlier, those points are just going to kind of fall through space and just keep going forever until they have something to collide with. So let's actually hide this domino. And let's just focus on the liquid right now. I'm going to take this uh, volume, this or rather this Bifrost object, and I'm going to shift select the ground. Actually, the ground I have hidden. I just have a simple ground plane. Uh, I just created something very basic for the ground, and I'm going to hide it. But I want to go in and create a collider, and then I'll just hide that ground plane. And now when I play this back, the particles are going to fall to the ground, and they're going to collide with the ground, and then they're going to begin to scatter. So... I've got the beginnings of a liquid simulation. It's very, very primitive at this point. Uh, I might want to also go in and incorporate that other domino. So I'll bring in the other liquid domino that I had here. Whoops, wrong one. Let's bring in the deflate domino, rather, this one. And this is actually the original cache uh, for that uh, cloth solve that I did before. I can scrub that. I want to actually use that as a collision object. So that's uh, no problem. I basically just go in and select the Bifrost object, shift select the collision, and then I just go in here and just say add collider. And now when I play this back, every time you add something new to the solve, by the way, it has to resolve. It has to start over essentially. So by adding that new collider, it had to resolve those particles. Now I push play and then that gets added to the solve. So it might slow things down a little bit, but not dramatically. And then now you can start to see it kind of displace those points, but it's really, really hard to see still because I have such a low resolution. You'll notice that as I push play, everything that's cached up to that point becomes scrubbable. So I can kind of go back in time, scrub that, and see it. But again, I can't really see what's going on because of the density. So I have a few options. So I have a few different nodes. I have the liquid shape node, which is the basically the output. The liquid shape node controls what it looks like, and it controls how it renders. So for instance, am I viewing particles, or am I viewing voxels, or am I viewing meshes. So I have the ability actually to go in and, and view a mesh, uh, and I can kind of start to see what that looks like. But even still, it doesn't quite look right. So I'm going to go back a step and, and go back into particle mode. And instead of changing the display, I'm actually going to go upstream. And instead, I'm going to go to the Bifrost liquid properties node. This is actually everything that has to do with the solve. So whereas the shape node has to do with the result, the Liquid properties node has to do with the solve the solution itself. So this is where you change physical properties like, for instance, viscosity or like uh, vorticity, uh, which is like a swirling motion. Viscosity is a thickness. But at the very top here, I have the most important attribute, which is the voxel size. So the master voxel size is essentially the density of the particles. And by default, it's really low resolution. So I'm going to dial that down, something like 0.2. And now when I rewind, you'll see that I get a much denser representation of the particles. When I push play, now you can see that the particles will fall to the ground. It's a little bit slower, although it's not dramatically slower, but it's a much better representation of uh, the actual solve itself. It's a much uh, higher quality representation. So now when I rewind this and scrub through, I can really start to get a feel for the behavior, and I can start to really see the collision. You can also see the color coding where it's white means there's a higher velocity. Where it's blue, it means it's going slower, basically. I can immediately tell I've got a little bit of a problem where I have kind of this weird kind of buffer between the two shapes. Uh, that basically is a collision uh, issue. So 
I can change that on a per object basis. So remember I had the ground collider. Uh, if I go into the conversion settings, I've got resolution size for each collider, but I also have a thickness for each collider. So I'm actually going to dial down the thickness for the ground. And also I created a separate collision for the domino. I'm going to dial down the thickness for the domino. And now that's going to be much more in line with uh, what I want. So now the domino is going to collide kind of more directly with those particles, and I won't have that weird kind of buffer. Now the other problem that I'm seeing is that the, the liquid it just immediately falls to the ground. But really what I want to do there actually looks a little bit better there where it's displacing it. What I really want to do is have the liquid start right as that domino is hitting it. So I want it to look like the domino is causing the, the liquid kind of uh, collapse. So I'm going to scrub through and just kind of eyeball this. I'm going to say right about there is where it's going to collide. And that is frame 22. So I mentioned the two nodes. I've got, if I grab the Bifrost object, I've got the shape, which has to do with the output of the Bifrost uh, solve. And then I have the liquid properties, which has to do with the input. And then at a higher level, I have the liquid container, which has to do with more of the higher level solver. So this is what kind of uh, evaluation are you doing? Are you using a cache? And also things like the start frame. By default, it always starts at 1. I instead want to have it start at 2, or sorry, 22. So now, when I play this back, it doesn't do anything until frame 22. Then the particles kick in, the solve starts, and now it makes it more or less look like the, the cloth domino is now creating that collision, and then it's kind of collapsing in and around it. So a couple other things to point out is that you can really get a, a lot of uh, detail as far as the, the way this liquid looks just based on the particles themselves. Like you can really see a lot uh, in the, the motion of the particles to get an idea of what that's going to look like. Uh, but sometimes you need to see a little bit more detail. So I mentioned you've got a couple of different modes. So you've got the voxel mode, which, which is a little bit more, it's, a, it's volumetric particles basically those particles with volume. And then I've got the, the geometry mode, which actually gives me um, a mesh, which kind of gives me an idea of what that's going to look like, although it's not quite accurate at this point, which I'll explain in a bit. But let's undo that and point out that you can also just quickly go into Arnold. So just set up a few lights and then just bring up your Arnold render, and that will immediately render your Bifrost particles. So Bifrost particles can be directly rendered with Arnold. Uh, you don't have to convert it to a mesh. And all it does is it uses an Arnold shader. So if I were to go in here and uh, go to the end of this, I've got an Arnold shader attached to this, and I can just change the settings for the Arnold shader where I can go in and I could say, well, I want this to be shiny red balloon, and it'll switch the shader uh, parameters accordingly, or I might want to go in and make this uh, you know, more of a milk or something like that. Actually, that's a little bit too transparent, but I might want to make this actually, let's make it something really obvious like, a gold. So it's just using a standard Arnold material uh, for this. And I've actually got a preset here for the uh, ivory. So I can switch over into the same exact material that the other domino is rendering with. So you'll see the domino on the ground is rendering with the same material that the domino here is rendering. One other thing to point out about rendering is that if you grab the Bifrost node, and I'll pull this up a little bit, there connected to the liquid shape is an Arnold tab. And if you go to the Arnold tab, you can actually change the way that Arnold is kind of interpreting these particles. So in other words, for instance, am I rendering out voxels or am I rendering out particles? You'll get different results depending on the mode you're in. Uh, you can also go in and you can change things like the, uh, the particle rendering parameters. So right now I've got a really high surface radius. So I could dial that surface radius down and it's going to give me a, a thinner uh, or less thick object. I can also go in and I can do smoothing. So I can say, for instance, let's add a little bit of smoothing to this, and it's going to round out all those corners and get rid of all those droplets. And you can kind of dial this in and out. It works with the interactive rendering while you're going. Every once in a while, you'll get this uh, kind of unshaded mode. That just means you have to kick the renderer back up again because it's created a new uh, representation of that. But pretty quickly, you can go in and start to play with these parameters and get something uh, that looks pretty decent in the Arnold render view. Now, obviously, I need to tweak that a little bit more, but the end result is going to be uh, a liquid simulation that I would then bake out similarly to the way I baked out the cloth. So you would basically take your liquid simulation once you get it looking exactly how you want it, and then you would output that. 
uh, or rather cache that out. So you go to Bifrost, and there is a compute and cache to disk option. So this works very similarly to the to the in cloth example that I showed, except it's creating a different type of cache. It's an in cloth, or rather, sorry, a, a, a Bifrost cache. So this all comes together in kind of a master scene here, where I've basically got all the different systems kind of integrated. The systems themselves aren't, but the results are integrated. So if I go back to frame one, you can see I've got the pool ball coming in, and then it solves, uh, or rather kicks the domino, uh, and then I get the domino effect based on the bullet physics. And then as I pull in here, I've got the, the cloth object right here, which I can kind of scrub right now. And then when I get to that first frame where the cloth uh, intersects, so the, the bouncy domino intersects with the bifrost, then that will load the cache. And then now as I scrub through, then you can see the cache effect. And then I've actually added another little uh, another little bullet solve here at the end. And so this actual domino right here is actually a collision object for Bifrost, and it's being pushed. Um, I'm kind of faking that part because Bifrost technically won't drive the mesh, but you can have a little bit of animation on the mesh, and then Bifrost will just react to that animation. And so that is kind of pushing forward, falling down, and then that's just going right into another bullet solve. So we're right at the end of the, the demonstration. I just wanted to bring up one more file. I didn't have time to show this, but I'll just show you what it is. Before you actually render all of this out, I might want to actually go in and block out my sequences in Maya uh, using the camera sequencer. So basically, I would go in and create a variety of cameras. And these cameras would basically show me different views of my scene, depending on what I want to show. Uh, and then I can create these clips. This is similar to the time editor, but these clips are camera clips or camera shots. And then I can load the different cameras so that uh, as I scrub through the sequencer timeline, it will actually cut from one camera to the next and then allow me to see the full animation uh, in sequence or in order. Now, you wouldn't necessarily render this out directly, but you can use this as a mechanism for basically figuring out your timing figuring out you know, where, which camera needs to be where, how many frames you need to have for that camera. And then ultimately, you can use this to just predefine your frame ranges and then render those cameras out directly and then load them all up together in an external application. Something like RV, which you'll see here, is a media player that, that we provide. You can either get it with a shotgun license or you can buy it separately. But RV would allow you to take all those different camera shots and if I turn it into kind of a default layout mode here, you can see these are all the different cameras that I rendered out from Maya based on uh, what I kind of pre-visualized in Sequencer. So you can see that each one of these is a different shot. And then I can basically order these together and set my frame ranges in uh, the sequence mode, and then I can play them all back together. So now when I kind of stack these all up together, I can get a pretty good idea of what my final sequence is going to look like. Now, I might want to actually take this into Premiere to do my final edit or some other editor, but RV can be a really nice way of just doing a quick basic edit. It also does some basic compositing as well. And you can also save out from here. So I can actually go in, and once I do my sequencing in RV, I can come in here and I can export this out to a QuickTime movie or a new image sequence, and uh, I could be done with it, or I could like I said, move on to something like Premiere to do the, the, final, uh, the final edit. So this is the actual final sequence. Once again, I'll just let that play through. But this is all of it kind of coming together and all the various sequences kind of uh, laid out in order. So that pretty much wraps it up. Again, uh, as I mentioned before, I've got a, a couple of different online things that you can check out. If you like the kind of stuff that I showed today and you want to learn more about Maya, uh, go to the Facebook and like the Facebook page, Maya Maya. Go to YouTube, uh, follow their YouTube channel. And then also, occasionally I'll do some posts on Autodesk Area website, which is a community portal uh, for all of our various entertainment products. And I've got a blog there. Uh, but hopefully that was useful for everybody, and hopefully you'll be able to do some things with Maya that maybe you hadn't been able to do before. So uh, that'll be the end of the webinar. All right, thanks.